One of the fastest growing segments for Alfresco is the government marketplace, and we thought it would be a good opportunity to give you a sense of some of the applications that people are using Alfresco for. And I'm real excited. We've got two great uh, speakers today to talk about how they're utilizing Alfresco in their particular environment. Uh, the first person that's going to be speaking today is Joel Ben, and Joel is uh, part of a New York City sanitation department. And it's interesting, they, they made a big investment in Alfresco, but they found some interesting applications when Hurricane Sandy came last year that they were able to leverage the technology in different ways that they had never expected before. So he'll be talking more about that today, but, but Joel brings over 20 years of experience in the financial community. He's been a, in the public service uh, arena for the last couple of years. I think you'll find the story very, very intriguing. And our second speaker is Brian Campo, and Brian uh, brings a lot of expertise on the federal side, uh, particularly in the DOD arena. And Brian was a uh, uh, former Navy submarine uh, engineer, nuclear engineer, he brings a lot of experience within the DOD community, he's been working within that community, and he's going to be talking about how they're working with the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and the Joint Chiefs of Staff has this initiative called the Joint integrated environment and it's about getting all of the different commands to, together and they have hundreds if not thousands and thousands of records that they're trying to capture. It's a very paper-based oriented environment and he's going to talk about some of the challenges and how they're going about uh, helping them out to move forward using Alfresco. So um, as Joel is setting up, we had a little bit of a technical uh, difficulty in terms of uh, getting everything together, but I think we're going to get going here in just a couple of seconds. What I'd like to do is keep this interactive. Uh, typically, we wait until the end of the presentation, but we've been running a little bit late, so if you have questions, I know Joel and Brian will both be happy to address it. If there's something that comes up or some particular point that they're making, feel free to raise your hand and, and ask a question. I want to keep it as interactive as possible. So with that, Joel, I know we're putting a lot of, uh, <laughs> getting the system up here. Hey, it's Microsoft, what can I say? <laughs> Probably should have introduced myself, by the way. Bill Goodson, um, I'm responsible for the government business at Alfresco, so I've had an opportunity to work with, with both of these individuals, and um, I'm happy to answer any questions, too at the end of the session as well. Yeah, where? Yeah, yeah slideshow, okay. From beginning. But where's the, I'm gonna click it from here. Yeah, all right, so, no, he said it was some kind of remote, but okay. No remote. We're set here, oh well. Now Bill introduced me. I, the whole beginning part is gone. Yeah, I don't know what to say. Anyway, uh, I'll just start from the beginning then. My name's Joel Vin, as he mentioned. I'm responsible for content management at the New York City Department of Sanitation. I've been working with computer systems for doing business alignment, mostly in government and financial services for about 30 years, which is pretty much what most New York techs do, I think, except maybe the recent arrivals from Google, either in financial services or government in New York. Thankfully, our, our new mayor is a Sox fan, so I didn't have trouble getting into Boston, so I was lucky in that respect as well. But before I go into real detail of, of this, I also wanted to go a little bit, digress a little, maybe go a little memory lane. when. 20 years ago, when you're looking at content management systems, the drivers were very different. PCs were relatively new, and <coughs> the idea was, how do you get board, a board that can actually read paper and make it electronic back then? And early companies like FileNet used to have these giant rooms with 12-inch optical platters and this crazy device that used to, within 10 minutes, be able to find the right optical and get you your information. Also dealt with a, a company called FileQuest. Uh, they were a bunch of NASA scientists that were developing a card that would compete with like Kofax and others back then. 
In fact, uh, one of them, John Shute, his project is the oldest running project on the moon today. He built the, ref the reflectors that sit there that the lasers shoot off of to uh, get much more accurate distances from the moon. So they were, they were pretty interesting people, but uh, as things that worked out, I guess they became part of the future rather than uh, their own future. Anyway, today, as, as uh, Bill mentioned, we're going to go into why sanitation decided to get involved with El Fresco and some surprising um, outcomes that we didn't plan in terms of Hurricane Sandy. Um, for those of you that don't know, the Department of Sanitation is the largest organization of its kind in the world, the New York City Department of Sanitation. We have close to 10,000 people that pick up over 15,000 tons daily. Private carters pick up another 15,000 tons, which means every day the city of New York transports out, because we don't have landfills, 30,000 tons of waste on a daily basis. We have over 6,000 vehicles to accommodate this. 3,000 are collection trucks. We have street sweepers. We have support vehicles. And we also have about a fleet of about four or 500 salt and sand spreaders, because when winter comes around, sanitation turns into a snow fighting force. All the collection trucks can be enabled with plows. We have the salt spreaders. We become first responders. So snow and other emergencies are something that's very important and we take very seriously. Now, the Department of Sanitation has a lot of unique things that we do. We have a unique approach to handling our gaps in our 30-year-old mainframe system. The way we uniquely handle that is with paper. We have over 900 forms that we fill out, and we manually fill out close to 3 million sheets every single year. That's not counting what we print by computer. We also have unique ways of handling gaps in our processes and our documentation. We ask one of the old timers. That's our most effective way of figuring out how to get a job done, because they know. Other types of gaps that we also handle, we have unique approaches to, like uh, the way we handle project management. We use brute force. Something's a problem, let's show, just get rid of that problem. Most of the time, you're taking a mountain and you're moving it. We move mountains. Very effective. And you know, what can I say? You can't knock it. It works. Our technical support is also kind of unique. Most of our specialized reporting is also manpower driven. Most of our analytics are literally put together from paper, and the computer itself is nothing more than a glorified com um, calculator and typewriter for a good deal of our analytics. Finally, our approach to information management also has a very uh, unique mechanism to it. We archive all that paper. Those millions of sheets of paper, we keep it all. And in the case of things like medical and HR, we got to keep this stuff for decades. So we have a lot of paper, and moving paper around is almost as big a business as our waste collection. So as challenging as it may seem, and we all may think resistance is futile to automation, they resist it very much at, sa at sanitation in terms of their day-to-day -day operation. And why do they resist it? Because unlike something like banking or other types of industries, we really don't need the computers. The computers make us more efficient. It saves us money, but we can still get the job done. A bank without computers can't function today. We can function. So computers are an add-on, a help, a facilitator. It's not what's core to making the business run. So it's adoption becomes a, a much more challenging effort. But that said, the future really is set. We are putting in or, more automated systems. We are putting in content management systems. We are moving up into, shall we say, state of the art. We're not, certainly not bleeding edge. And as we move forward with that, in our pantheon of technologies that we picked, Alfresco is the key element in terms of our content management solutions. Now, how did we get there? Well, originally, when we decided we got to go for electronic content management solutions, we looked at different drivers. We wanted something that was going to be an enterprise-wide solution. We wanted to be able to integrate with our core applications that were being, new ones that were being built today. 
We wanted to have electronic approval and workflow. We didn't want to do all these manual signing because everyone signs everything at sanitation. I mean, it's just a lot of signatures. And as it turns out, business continuity became a factor, although we didn't realize it at the time. Now, when we went out to bid, we also did something unique. We hired Gartner. Gartner decided what our bid should look like, what we should do, how we should go out and get a product. Now, before I go into that bid process, I want to explain a little bit about the clinic. Just like um, mentioned in the new products demo this morning, the medical examiner of England is not the same as a medical examiner in the United States. They deal with dead people here and hopefully live people there. Well, the clinic here is not a clinic. It's really more like an insurance carrier. We are the type that we monitor people because as good or as bad as this may sound, our uniform people, police, fire, and sanitation, have unlimited sick days. If they're sick, if they get hurt on the job, and they're going to be out for six months, they get paid those six months. That's just, so because of that, we monitor it very closely because the city's self-insured. We approve. They come to the clinic for approval to go to the doctor, and we give them a form saying, OK, now you can go, yes, you really do have a broken leg. Yes, you really, your head really is smashed in, or whatever it is that happened to you when you were working. We also do a lot of processing. Like I said, we're self-insured. The medical bills are examined, approved, and go through our own payment systems. Because we are the insurance carrier. We also offer assistance. You know, if they have drug or alcohol problems, or they just want to, or family problems, we do have a unit that handles that. We also do new hire, and that's the only time we actually do examinations. When we're hiring a new class of workers, and we got several hundred coming in the clinic, that's the one time we actually do do physical examinations. And we do random testing. We go out in the field, we have trucks, and every so often we try to grab one and see if he's uh, clean, drug and alcohol testing. It's just part of the city process. All this was done manually. All this was written on paper. All this was tracked in paper files. So we went out and bid. And Gartner looked at what the city had and said, well, that's where we'll go out and bid. So we went out there. And what does the city have? The city has FileNet. We use that at, at many of our agencies. We use Documentum in many agencies. We have Oracle. In the case of sanitation, our core systems are being built on a PeopleSoft platform. And we said, OK, qualified systems integrators, give us a solution with one of them. And the bids were coming in somewhere between the six and $12 million range, well above anything we ever expected, because we wanted to start only with medical. And that was, if that was just medical's cost, we were like looking and saying, this is going to be really too painful. But one came in less than half of all the others. And they had something called Alfresco as their solution. And we looked and we got Alfresco. It's not anywhere in the city. But hey, money's money. So we said, OK, let's give it a try. <laughs> now, how do I get this thing to change slides? Oh, I was trying to do fun stuff in here. I made him wiggle. <laughs> oh, I should have used this. It's cool. <laughs> anyway. As we moved along, the medical system really did get uh, put in. We do have, and although it's in its only its early stages, it's running. We have uh, oh, seven to ten million documents in there, I think, right now. We're developing the workflow features, and we're planning. This is right now is our plan of action to start moving beyond the standard ECM functionality and move it into other types of functions. We're splitting out the ECM part so that other business units can also be custom built because customization is key. There's a lot of resistance. We build very custom UIs to keep people um, in a, uh, safe from the point of view that they see things that they're familiar with. We're not giving them standard screens. We're not giving them default screens. We really make it look as much like 
the paper and the processes that they're used to manually so that they don't you know, get the jitters or whatever it is that is going to make trouble. So we, we put it together that way. We also, as we expand, we got to look at the mobility aspects, and that's, um, you know, the earlier presentations were very exciting to us. We are a mobile fleet. 6,000 vehicles means that 80% of our workforce is out in the field. You know, it's like a salesman in the office isn't really a salesman. If we're not out in the field, we're not doing our job. That's where the vast majority of our workforce does what it's supposed to do. We also got to look at uh, handling things in some separate fashions because although we want the data to be common, analytics and different business units have their own way of slicing and dicing things. So we got to give them the ability to work independently and privately because some of it is man management style and when you got unions to deal with and stuff, you can't just have it open for everyone to look at. So you got to kind of keep things in separate, almost like silos but you want to keep the underlying content to be common. And, that, and that's uh, part of the things we plan to target as we uh, move forward with this implementation. Now, Hurricane Sandy, this is the use case uh, where we, we learned something. We knew Hurricane Sandy was coming, and the city, of course, prepared. We evacuated out of known flood zones. We mo in the case of sanitation, we moved all our vehicles to where we knew historically where most of the damage would be so that we can clean it up because this is the time when sanitation actually becomes an extremely important aspect because there's no police, there's no fire, there's no ambulance, nobody's coming to help you unless we clear those streets so that they can get through. So sanitation has a very important job with snow and with disasters. So we prepared and we were ready. But like almost everyone in the city, we weren't as ready as we thought we were. It was much worse than anyone expected. The entire downtown Manhattan was knocked out. Our headquarters had no power. The clinic was underwater. The entire downtown area was flooded. Everything was out. So we had to move our clinic. We moved it to Queens, and we set up shop because in an emergency of this type, all hands are out there, a lot of equipment moving around. We're moving a lot of big broken things. A lot of people get hurt. So it's important for that clinic to be operational. But they couldn't get to their paper. And although we did have the alfresco up, we kept the paper files. They didn't want to give up those paper files. They're used to the paper files. In fact, some of them could find things much faster in the paper files than, you, uh, than we could find in the computer. In fact, there's uh, one director there he would walk into a pile, a storeroom with piles and piles of x-rays. I think he was just as surprised as we were when he'd find the right x-ray and come out with it. <laughs> but he did it. It was just amazing. In any case, now they were sitting there. They could not get near their paper files. But they weren't dead in the water. We had our fresco system. We had ECM up and running. They could actually get to the files and do their job. So it really became a business continuity issue that we didn't anticipate, but turned out to be extremely fortunate. Well, now as I mentioned, this, this is just the start of where we're trying to go. But as it turns out, our ECM premise, at least in sanitation, is mostly productivity gain. You know, we're not out there increasing sales. We don't actually deal with a lot of the content, although big data and open data government, we might make stuff available, but we're not, we're not oriented to providing that kind of data outside of the organization. It's really to make the organization function better, whether it's staff management, um, better workflow, obviously reduction in printing, you know, I mean, the millions of dollars in printing we should be able to reduce in a very substantial way. Increased compliance, you know, uh, all the mandates now for electronic records, especially medical records, we'll be able to comply with much better. The endless entering and re-entering of data goes away because now we'll have a common base for, the, for these sources. And we'll start integrating into our core systems. 
And these kind of productivity gains are really the main driver why sanitation in particular is using it. And throughout the city, I think that there's a lot of similar momentum going on. Uh, there, there are different areas like uh, health and hospitals. I think they got over a billion paper records and they need a management system for that. There's a, they're looking at now sanitation much more than they <coughs> were looking at the other systems because the documentums and the file nets, they're big money pits, they're big resource pits, they're very expensive to operate. Not that they don't function, but the price point difference is substantial enough that people are taking notice. And I think that a lot of the other features, especially in our case, like mobility and others, is things that are going to be very important in our case. Um, I guess I should have had a slide that says Q&A, but uh, that's it. <laughs> sure. Yes. I noticed you had a, uh, one of your slides indicated the uh, document model. So could you take uh, could you, the document model, the customizations yes. that you had? You had, um, I think there was a medical, and then there yeah. were other document models. Could you speak a little bit about uh, the exercise of figuring out the right document models and and uh, you know how time consuming that was? Well, I, well, it was actually quite time consuming in the case of medical because, uh, like I mentioned, there's quite a large number of separate functions that they do. They're their own billing. I mean, they're basically a small insurance carrier. So we building that documentation model and trying to marry it to the uh, content management system and actually build a workflow that made sense for them is actually still an ongoing process. We've, we're taking in small chunks, working out like the, when people come in and handling that flow. Later, we'll work on the billing flow. and. It's mostly, uh, we got a lot of business analysts dealing with it, and I think that maybe we kind of went a little bit in the wrong direction because we had, we just went through standard business analysis. We probably should have got a little more uh, document management oriented people or got them trained more into it before we got in that direction. Some of the other organizations that were, or groups within our, our, our organization isn't quite as difficult, like a, legal. It's pretty straightforward what we got to do with them. But again, we're going to get a, we're having a large um, discussion now with our core system, which is PeopleSoft. And we want the underlying layer to be alfresco document management. And actually, it's, it's, a, it's an ongoing exercise right now where you're going to draw the lines, which functionality goes where. And the basic guideline is, base, is the information sits in alfresco but anything to do with operations or the day-to-day -day function, we're looking at PeopleSoft. But even though uh, it sounds simple, the complexity of each one, going through each one of, we got over 500 identified functions and they have you know, number of sub-functions under them, it, it's, it's an arduous process. It's a big process. And I think that having more people understanding content management beforehand would, uh, will save us time. So you said you had a lot of your content in paper. Yeah. And you needed to get it into content management. Right. Did, can you talk a little bit about the process and how long it took? Well, there were, there were two separate processes. There was the back scanning, and we hired an external firm to actually do all the back scanning and OCRing. And then we bought um, scanners. Currently, we're, we've only done this, like I said, in, in medical. And so scanning stations are set up at all the window areas where people come in, where they have scanners like for the billing groups, wherever paper flow is entering the system, they're gonna be doing their own scanning. So uh, in terms of the back scanning, it took months. You know, we couldn't let all the records leave, so they had to come in, they truck it in, they go out to their facility and back. There were a lot of uh, privacy rules we had to take care of because uh, you know, everything is, uh, the HIPAA laws, so it, 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 it was a bit time consuming, but it wasn't our time. It was all outsourced, uh, the back scanning part. Did you store the paper on the scanner? No, we're keeping it. <laughs> but 
but we're going to move it to a cheaper place than uh, Midtown Manhattan or Downtown Manhattan. <laughs> million as opposed to half a million. Uh, yeah. Did you actually get the project done within the budget or did you think that these guys probably just don't know the complexity of the solution? No, no, it actually came in at um, less than, well, from the high bidder, it was like 75% less and it did everything we, we wanted to do. So yeah, it really was a substantial savings. We, we were surprised at that because we have enterprise agreements with FileNet, we have enterprise agreements with Documentum, but it's like, if you need 40 components and 20 of them are on the enterprise agreement, the other 20 aren't. And those you gotta pay full price for, and it, it just became very expensive. And the systems integrators were taking a much more, you know, uh, classical approach, so that also added a lot of cost, as opposed to a company that was just focused on creating a document management solution. So when you took away the, the fluff of generalized <coughs> processes, it got a lot less expensive. So yeah, it was, it was, just, it was just as effective as using them. Sure. Thank you. As Bill mentioned, my name is Brian Campo, um, and I work for a company called Stop. So we are primarily a DOD, and I see a few faces from my earlier presentation on RM. Um, so some of this will seem the same, but I think you'll get a bigger scope of, of what we're talking about. Um, so our solution uh, was based around a task and records management. Um, so it's a little bit different spin on the ECM landscape from what you generally expect. Um, and so you'll kind of get a little feel for that, but to give you an idea, uh, in the public sector and a lot of what Alfresco does, a document goes through a workflow. Um, and so on our side, we have a task, which is a workflow, and we collect documents as part of that task. So for us, our use case was very, very different from what Alfresco did. And one of the great things was that as we started to talk to Alfresco, they were very receptive. Um, and it required a fair bit of changes to both the thought process and also to the different ways that Alfresco works. Um, and so I'll kind of go over those, um, but I do want to give a, you know, a, a huge round of applause to Alfresco. I know we've been a, a very interesting customer for them. Um, our customers have also been very interesting, um, but they've worked with us fantastically. So, so as I go through this, keep in mind that um, we don't generally have a document that spawns a workflow. We have a workflow that then grabs documents and they come in. Um, so for us, you know, a little bit of information about us. Um, we're primarily in a DOD landscape, so we're a little bit different um, in what we do and how we do it. Um, we're more of an SI, an integrator, um, that goes and does work directly for the government rather than going about to a company and implementing a technology for them. Um, and I'm also going to apologize ahead of hand. Um, within the DOD, not a lot of fluff in a presentation, so my presenting style of slides is, is very, to the point, very informative. Um, and I'm not going to read them, I'm going to skim through them, but I do want, if we got any questions as we go through, please feel free to jump in. Um, I want to make sure that we, we kind of tailor this to um, what you guys are looking for. Um, so what we did was we were brought into the joint staff and we worked with them to try and understand what they do from a task and records management perspective. Uh, they had an existing installation of Documentum, Metastorm, uh, Cognos. They had a very, very proprietary uh, solution stack. Um, and one of the things we did was we knew that we needed to get this platform out to the government and it was trying to find out who was the right place to go, who were the right sponsors, who were the people that were willing to, to uh, look at the solution a little bit differently and allow us to come in with something that generally doesn't happen in the DOD, which is an open source platform um, based around a uh, community driven landscape. Um, and so one of the things was we found Major General Bowman, who is the Joint Staff J6. He's basically the CIO for the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Um, we also got the DOD CIO, who was previously the CIO for the state of California. So we found two very, very good sponsors that were willing to 
believe in open source, um, and adopt the, kind, the concept of open source. And I've been working open source for the government for about six years now. Um, I'm actually on the chair for the Military Open Source Solutions uh, Board. So part of what we do is get open source solutions out into the government. And can you tell people what JCS does? Sure. So the Joint Chiefs of Staff, um, and I, I apologize, I, didn't, yeah, I know we've got a very international audience. So the DOD um, has a very hierarchical structure. Um, basically, the Secretary of Defense has groups under him that do certain things. And the primary group under him that does implementation is the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Um, and so what they are is they're across the board, so they're Army, Navy, and Air Force, um, along with combatant commands. And the Joint Chiefs of Staff, their job is to take what the Secretary of Defense wants to do, and the President and other people as well, and actually push those down to the the people that actually do it. So when the Joint Chiefs of Staff get a request from the Secretary of Defense, they create a tasker. Um, and a, a real simple overview would be uh, the Secretary wants to investigate uh, whether we need a new battleship. Um, so what he'll do is he'll start a tasker, he'll send it down to the Joint Chiefs of Staff, they'll put out a task down through our system, um, collect input from the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, they'll collect it from the combatant commands, and it goes down all the way to the people who actually might be the CO of a ship or the people that might do maintenance on the ship. So when a task comes from the Secretary of Defense, we might have as much as four or 500 different collaborators on a single tasker. Um, so the system really has to be able to um, be as distributed as it is robust. Um, so, so from those taskers, then we collect documents that go into ECM. They then become records. Um, so one of the things we started with was, what are your high-level capabilities? What do you really want this solution to do? Um, had to be scalable, because again, we've got uh, you know, as many as um, 500 collaborators on a task. Um, when we put this out as an enterprise service, and I'll talk about that a little bit later, is we're expecting about 400 to 600,000 different records managers alone, probably close to 2 million people interacting with this system from both the task and the records uh, management perspective. So it is a massively scaled solution that we'll be deploying over the next few years. Um, robust capabilities had to be able to do this without massive amounts of customization. Um, we had to be able to leverage a cloud environment. Um, and again, Bill had mentioned the JIE initiative. Um, so one of the things that the Joint Chiefs of Staff are doing is they're building out a government cloud, a massive AWS-like cloud um, utilizing all these disparate data centers that the government has. Um, so they're trying to incorporate and consolidate those down into one single cloud. So this solution will be the first enterprise service put out on that cloud, and it really is the use case for how a cloud-enabled solution can work throughout the government. They're very siloed right now. So the JIE initiative was huge for us, especially because General Bowman, that is his baby. Um, and it also had to be able to integrate with other task and records management systems. Again, everybody has their own system right now, and what they're trying to do is bring these together, but we understand that we can't go from scratch and tell everybody, day one, you're coming over here. It's gotta be a slow migration. Um, we did not have, like a lot of the people you hear today, where they decided, okay, we're gonna go away from what we've got, we're gonna start a new system, and we're just gonna flip a switch. For us, it's a much more transitional migration. Um, the joint staffs are going to start, and then we're going to go to the next level down, and we're going to get them on board. Um, lots of migration, lots of transitionary elements. So until we get all those people on board, we've got to be able to talk to the other systems. We've got to be able to integrate with them, pass taskers back and forth, allow them to come into our repository and get content, as well as take rep uh, content from their repository and pull it into ours. And so what we did was we looked at what are the key things that we've got to be able to do. We've got to be able to leverage CMIS because that is the only standard right now that provides support for moving this type of content across all the different repositories. And unfortunately, even CMIS doesn't reach all of them. Um, SharePoint Web Services is huge because SharePoint has a, a massive install base with the DOD. Um, Microsoft has done a great job of marketing to them and they've done a great job of, of getting a foothold. Um, but just as Joel mentioned, there is a lot of cost involved. Um, so while we're doing the replacement, we have to be able to leverage SharePoint as a repository. We have to be able to bring content back and forth. Um, Tasker Integration Services is an initiative within the DOD specifically to allow some of this. 
Um, and we have to be able to leverage it, but it never really took off. It never got off the ground. So um, that was a very DOD specific. And then the other one that they were looking for was, and I'll get to it uh, a little bit later on, is vendor lock-in. So it had to be an open standard, and that's where OASIS comes in. So OASIS defines standards, and Alfresco has done a fantastic job of working on those standards and applying and being applicable across the standards body. Um, so for them to be able to ensure that whatever product they put out now is going to be standards based so that if something comes along later they know that they won't have a huge issue like we're having now. Um, so the objectives. We had to be able to get rid of all of these massive silos. So we had to be able to get rid of redundant, redundant capabilities across the DOD. Um, we had to be able to show that what we could do was common and available and would be able to be leveraged across the entire enterprise. So making sure that whatever solution we chose would be able to work with the Air Force, would be able to work with the processes that um, somebody like a Cybercom has, would be able to be supportable by all the policies that are coming out from the DOD CIO. Wanted to make sure it leveraged open technology. Was SOA able and was able to work within an agile framework for deploying capabilities. Um, had to make sure that the cloud computing piece was there. Make sure that we could do identity management across the enterprise. Uh, one of the things that they're running into now is they're trying to do the same sort of thing with enterprise email, where there's one email system throughout the whole DOD. And they've had huge issues with Microsoft's um, Active Directory, being able to scale it, being able to roll it out. So what we did was we decomposed a lot of these pieces, and I'll get to the, the different pieces that we use. Um, but the modular nature of Alfresco was also key. Um, and then the last one, to be able to work with uh, SPAWAR, which is an engineering command inside the government, um, to be able to work directly with the warfighter. And there was a lot of things that came on board with that. Um, warfighters have limited connectivity. We, we now assume that basically connectivity, internet access, comes with us wherever we go. Um, but when a warfighter is deployed, they have very limited connection. Um, a lot of times you'll have two, three hundred people sharing what amounts to about 128, bit, uh, 128 kilobit connection. So we had to make sure that we kept in mind both those people that are stateside as well as the warfighters out in the field um, and be able to provide them the same capabilities. Um, so this is a quick slide. I'm not going to go through everything, but really what it came down to was the part about finding the sponsor. Um, General Bowman has been a CIO just about everywhere he's been. So he was very technologically savvy, unlike 90% of the people in the government. Um, he does understand open source's role. He's not necessarily a proponent of open source, but he does understand that when the solution fits, it doesn't matter whether it's open source or not. Um, he's not in favor of massive licensing deals. Um, and so when we came to him with a good value proposition, which I'll get to, um, he really understood and appreciated um, the idea of putting open source out. And then when we let him know he could be the first enterprise solution ever to be an open source platform, he was very receptive of that. Um, so as far as the components go, um, what we were looking for was total cost of ownership, right? The government is in their austere times right now. They're looking for ways to do a lot more with a lot less. They're looking for ways to save money, um, and they're looking for ways to reduce the need for these massive expenditures that they've got. Um, Per user costs were big. Per user costs for things where a, a person only uses a solution for a short time, but they have to have a seat license. Um, that was the number one thing that they wanted to get away from. So Alfresco, with a usage model, and a lot of open source products have this, the usage model of Alfresco was key to them, especially deploying this out to the enterprise. Um, rapid deployment was something that we wanted. Enterprise collaboration with SharePoint was an absolute must have. Um, and the ability to access and drive new capabilities um, and a lot of the different things that come with having access to the source code. Um, that was really, really big because we've got a lot of things that we've got to be able to do um, from patching, from being able to handle security vulnerabilities, to actually deploying out small bits of code that might need to interact with the overall solution. And then obviously the fast response. Um, open source companies, generally have patch times of two to four weeks. Uh, if anybody's ever worked on a very specific patch with Microsoft that's specific to you, uh, generally you'll hear three to six months. So just the response of being able to work with a company um, that handles the open source model um, was very, very big. So our platform right now is Alfresco Enterprise Content Management. 
Um, and we are pure vanilla alfresco, minor customizations, minor um, augmentations of capability, but we're using share. We're using base ECM. We're using a lot of the different things as they come from Alfresco. Um, and the customer's been very happy with it. You know, granted, they're coming from a very, very old system. Um, but a lot of what, they, what they've seen so far, they really, really like. And in fact, after doing the Alfresco demo, they actually asked us to stay with what Alfresco had um, so that they really like the interface. Uh, JasperSoft is our reporting. Postgres is our database. And Shibboleth is our single sign-on. All of these are are decomposed into um, encapsulated capabilities, not tied to each other, so we can scale them all independently. We can find out where some latency issues might be, and we can fix specifically. We're not tied to an entire Microsoft stack where we can't do that. Um, the value and benefits, like I mentioned. This is really the slide that drives home how we were successful with the government. Um, O&M costs, so year-over-year -year licensing costs, they're going to save about 40%. Um, and that number is actually expected to grow as they get more enterprise and as they get more usage for their licenses. Um, we expect on an enterprise capability that to reach somewhere near 70% um, as it would relate to something like a SharePoint. Um, DISA tried to do something with SharePoint. They're looking at, the number varies depending on how much for records management alone, we were looking at close to 80%. Task and records management, you know, they're looking at about $700 million to deploy that as an enterprise service. We're very, very confident we'll be able to do it for well less than 100, probably around $80 million. Um, and when you look at 2 million users, that's a pretty intense um, cost per user savings. Um, open API, uh, task integration. The big one also is the ability to scale. The scalability um, for us being able to get them to understand it was nice because Alfresco already had a cloud implementation. And their cloud implementation was doing numbers very similar to what we expected to do in the next year or so. So the Alfresco cloud was a great case study for us to use to go in and talk to the customer about. Um, and so for, for one other point that I want to bring home, um, from our side, Alfresco really provided a one-size-fits-all, and that was really big. Right now, they have to go to five different systems. They have to go into one system. They have to go out of that system and into another one. With Alfresco, especially because of the open source side, we're able to completely leverage the Alfresco share interface. We can build widgets. We can build add-ons. And they never have to leave a single application. Um, and for training purposes, that was huge. Um, and so uh, Q&A. Um, Anybody have any questions? Um, in your battleship example, where you said you know there are hundreds of people involved, mm -hmm. and using Alfresco to connect a variety of systems, how do you manage the work through, workflow? Because you're you're going in and out of Alfresco, I assume, to accomplish that. Right, right, absolutely. And that's where the integration services come in. So what we do um, in those cases, and, and, and I'll take a little bit smaller case because it'll be a little bit more explanatory. Um, so with the uh, classified information dissemination that happened, right? So some classified information got out. There was a tasker to evaluate where this happened, how it happened. Um, and so we had to work with Cybercom, Stratcom. The Joint Chiefs of Staff had to work outside of their own build. Um, so what we do is we get it in from the Secretary of Defense. We actually take and we pass, um, we have triggers basically. So we take a task and the task completes a section. It then goes out to like a SharePoint. Um, so in the case of Stratcom, they're using SharePoint. It goes to SharePoint, kicks off a SharePoint workflow automated. They go through that workflow and then it, there at the end of it, we worked with them to create a trigger that then accesses the Alfresco API to kick off another workflow. So we decompose the workflow into manageable chunks and we used a lot of automation and a lot of integration to do that. And then the documents as well. So using something like a CMS, um, we pass that document in. We then attach it um, and bring that document back. But ideally, in the long term, um, they would all be off fresco. So we would just be passing it sort of in that hybrid that they showed this morning. We take that hybrid idea of moving it up to the cloud, having that cloud then uh, be accessible by somebody. Or even better would be something where we can actually have multiple Alfresco servers that can talk to each other. They can take ownership of a task or a piece of content and move it back and forth. And it sounds like some of that is coming 
in the future roadmap that they showed this morning. How did you um, address the possible security issues of hosting stuff in the cloud versus on premises and how is that received? And is it because you, it sounds like you're building sort of a private cloud that, that that was what was finally able to be accepted internally? Right, so, there was, so there's two parts to that. Um, one is how do they look at security? Um, and that was one of the biggest hurdles that we had was from an open source perspective, right? The risk versus the secure aspect of it. Um, it took a long time. We spent about four months prepping before we even started on this. So um, getting them to understand that open source doesn't equal risk, um, especially with Alfresco being that corporate led like they talked about this morning. Um, corporate led really gave them a little bit of security that there is a, you know, there's somebody I can go point to. I can call up John Newton and I can say, hey, look, you know, this is an insecure product and he's going to fix it um, versus a community led like a Drupal. Um, so, so getting them to understand the concepts of, of open source being secure was part of it. And we did a lot of work with them. And, and that's where, from a mil, mil OSS perspective, I was able to work with them and show them. One of the slides I don't have on this that I had on my earlier presentation is that we're working with Alfresco to become part of the Trusted Code Initiative at the Open Source Solutions Institute. Um, and so I also work with those guys. And the Trusted Code Initiative basically says, these are things that have gone through all of the review processes for the DOD. And they have been seen as secure. They've been validated. They've been certified. They've been accredited to work on a DOD network. So that is another way that we're working with the government to help them understand that you can use an open source solution just like you could use it. And you can trust it. And you can believe in it. The second part, which is the security. Um, yeah, so right now what we've got is we are deployed on the classified network. So that is a completely walled garden. Um, it's not accessible from the internet. It's basically a, a separate internet built beside it um, for classified documents. So that was one of the reasons why we went out there is we knew we could go out there and not have the same sort of penetration issues um, because they've already got safeguards in place for that. Um, within the cloud perspective, we're actually going to use AWS is standing up a gov cloud. Um, and that is a sort of a walled garden, but sort of not. It still leverages the same data center, still does the same things. Um, and that's where really we've got to reevaluate how cloud works. And that's part of the JIE initiative. Um, so JIE is going to work with separate data centers as well as AWS cloud. Um, but we're going to have to do a lot of work before we get there. Um, the security side of it is always a concern with the government. Um, and what we're working with now is uh, walled off instances. So we are in, even when we go nipper, so when we go to unclassified, um, we're going to be working in AWS, but we're going to have them walled off and basically firewall the entire thing. So it's a, it's a, it's a way of firewalling um, in addition to all the security. And then we also have things like CAC, PKI. So we've got PKI so that only people uh, that are known by the government can get in. Um, and so we're doing three levels of security for that. Um, so there's a lot of things to be done. Um, but that was one of the huge hurdles we had to get through. So congratulations first. Uh, Thank you, we, a couple of years ago, we worked with Booz Allen on the task integration stuff with yep. WHS and, and, and with the joint staff. And I understand how political yes. it is to get people to, uh, to migrate um, as, as each one of these have their own tasker. So one of the questions is around the whole migration and, and really access control. How, how are you getting the users into the system from, from, a, from a, is there a federated um, uh, directory services mm -hmm. into their systems, or are you creating these on the fly? How, how are you dealing with the, the access control side? Right, so um, from an access control perspective, uh, one of the things that came along with the enterprise email is they also have an enterprise directory now. So our company, um, one of the things we do is we work with DMDC, which is uh, the owners of the information about everybody that works in the federal government, whether it be military, civilian, or contractors. Um, so that was an easy part for us, even though it was a lot of work, um, because we had people working at DMDC. So there's an enterprise directory um, that exists for everybody. And so what we do is we synchronize an LDAP. Um, and so if you looked at Shibboleth, um, Shibboleth is actually our, our security provider and identity provider. Um, and so that kind of happens outside of Alfresco. And it's, it's interesting to, to see the connection there. Uh, but what we do is we're, we become a child LDAP to the enterprise directory. Um, and then we pull in users that have certain flags, certain criteria that we can identify. Um, we pull in their CAC information. We pull in their PKI so that we can then authenticate them. We give that to the LDAP. Um, Shibboleth validates before they get to the LDAP. 
and then we're using the LDAP synchronization um, to bring them into Alfresco. So a user has to be, A, part of DMDC, then they've got to be part of our LDAP, and then once they do that, when they try to log into Alfresco, it goes back and checks them. Um, so there's three, that's the three levels that I was speaking of. So we use Shibboleth to check for a CAC, make sure that they're actually part of the government. We then go into the LDAP, make sure they're part of the LDAP, and then we forward their request onto Alfresco, which goes and pulls that information, creates some account if they've never been part of the system before. Do you think the groups also and, and the yes. map those to Apple? Yes, so, so security gets a lot more hairy with Alfresco. Um, but we do pull in group information. We pull in uh, organizational information so we can actually tell what commands and what branches they're part of. Um, and that's sort of how we assign them to sites. So we've done a lot of automation on that side of it. Um, to, to really leverage the organizational hierarchy that they've got, because in the government hierarchy is everything. Thanks, everybody. I appreciate it. Thanks.